Well, um, one of my favorite things to do is to, uh, when I go to a church or am at a church and, and sometimes look behind the pulpit and see what you see back here, it's always entertaining. A couple weeks ago, I realized I, I've been missing one of my favorite uh, travel mugs. And it's this one. It says life is good on it. And it's still got some coffee in here, I think. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I was pleasantly surprised as I looked under the pulpit and I found it. You know, you just never know the, the excitement that you get. We used to, I used to work at the Tinderbox in Winston-Salem. It's my high school job. And we would sell all kinds of kind of quirky little stuff. Uh, one of the things we had was were, were lighters. You know, it's a place for pipes and tobaccos and cigars and cigarettes and those things back before it became public enemy number one. Uh, and, and people would come in and they'd look at these fancy lighters and they're like, oh my Lord, I'd never pay $400 for a lighter. I would lose it. And the line that we always used in the store was, well, if it's important enough and you pay enough for it, you'll find it. You start retracing, you're, you're looking for the things that are most important to you. They kind of bugs you when you can't find it. And the more special it is to you, the more important it becomes. And the more obsessed we get about finding it. This is the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Oftentimes in seminary courses and, and New Testament classes or even Bible studies, it's referred to as the lost chapter of Luke. It's not that it's lost, we can't find it. It's all about that the, everything in the story is about being lost and being found. And so, so in this passage, we're, we're the, 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 the uh, youngest son goes to the father and says, Look, give me what, give me what, I, I, what you want me to have. I'm out of here. Give me your stuff and I'm gone. And so in the culture, in the Jewish culture, this is kind of an, a, a true anomaly of a thing to do. Uh, there's some debate about what is all in property sharing. Sometimes in the property, it would go just singular to the eldest of the sons. Other times, it would be divided. But it always took place not at when the father was still alive, but at the father's death. And so for this youngest son to go up to his father and say, hey, give me my stuff, means I, you, you can die if you want to. I really don't care. I just want my stuff. And so the father, being the father that's kind, gracious, evidently, gives him half of what he owns. And the son in a couple days packs up, takes off into a foreign land, away from home away from the life he had known, and went off. I got to thinking about budgeting a little bit. I've noticed one thing in being an adult and living into what it means to be an adult, running a household, that my discretionary spending fund has a tendency to run out long before the bills are all covered. Well, I've got to have this. I need this. Life will not be complete without it. I know it's more than I'm supposed to spend, but I'll make up for it next month. Do you know how that goes? It's like, gee, man, only if everything would be bought on 0% interest for the rest of my life, it would be great. I'll eventually get it paid off. I just need that. I've got to have it. But yet, there are bills to be paid. There's stuff to do. There's necessities that must take place. There's gas to buy in the car somebody said the other day they said I don't normally brag about luxurious items that I purchase but I just got a tank of gas but this, this youngest son this, he got all, all he had, was going to get from the father and he took off and in just a little bit of time he wasted it he was gone I don't know he could have went to the casino for one night and it was gone thought he was going to make it big but he didn't work that way. Got a job. Not a bad plan. He got a job for a Jewish person feeding the pigs. So even the pigs, the unclean animals, had something to eat, and he didn't. Comes to a census a little bit and says, Oh, I got an idea. I'll go back to Dad. He's so kind and gracious and loves me. He'll take me back. I'll apologize. 
So he heads on back toward home. And gets there. And the father somehow sees him. Something tells me the father had been looking. Just a little bit. Waiting, hoping. Something might change. That the youngest son might return. I don't know. I don't know. I wasn't there. But he sees him coming back down the road. And the father runs out to meet him. Embraces him in his arms, brings the robe, kills the fatted calf, places a ring on his finger. He has been reestablished. He's come home. The youngest son. Maybe this is one of those great stories that's really good for us to hear in Lent. Sometimes we get a little far away or our ideas and what's important to us stray from the heart of the gospel. Chasing after God and knowing who God is and loving God and God's people. Do our own thing, our own way. And after doing it a while, we realize how hollow and empty it leaves us. Well, it's time to come home. Gather up our things, whatever's left of it, whatever energy we have, whatever life we have left in us, and go home. But a lot of us, now, some of you have been sitting in the same pew here all for an awful long time. Especially the last two years since we reshuffled pews and created safe distances. It's always entertaining. But I say it feels like sometimes we have more than we used to when everybody would sit in one little section. We spread out. So there's a part of me that realizes that the, the younger brother kind of crowd isn't necessarily here this morning. It, in somewhere, and I don't remember if this was in seminary or college talking about this, that we talk about that. If you look in, in oftentimes in the little Bibles that we have, the heading for this passage is called the parable of the prodigal son. We've heard it all of our life. Oh, it's all about the prodigal son. It took me a whole while to figure out. One of my professors said, he said, those little headings over those passages that kind of give you a little clue what it is, he says, that's something an editor put in the Bible. That's not the word of Scripture. So, so one of my professors would, would suggest that this wasn't the parable of the prodigal son, but was the parable of the two sons. So, so in this parable, it's the older brother. The older brother that's been sitting in his church pew every Sunday for a while now doing what he's supposed to do, taking care of business, making sure the family farm keeps going, being the responsible party. I remember Rusty Inman at Boone Church, my freshman year of college, referred to this. He always said that the youngest son was hanging out down at the pig and chick on Saturday night, and the older son was home studying the Sunday school lesson. It's about a 25-year-old illustration. And that older son had been hanging around the farm doing what was supposed to be done and just kept going. And all of a sudden, coming in from the field on a hot, sweaty day, he hears all this music and this party going on and wants to know what in the world is happening. He's tired. just wants to sit down, get a cool glass of water, take a break calls somebody out what, what's going on in the house oh your younger brother's home well I'm so excited I can't wait to see him again you know well, what's all this music about oh your father father's called for a party a celebration killed the fatted calf to eat meat in this culture was not something we do we, we Americans especially eat a lot of meat in our diet, oftentimes, it's good, it's tasty. And yet, at the same time, we know it's really not good for our bodies, so maybe perhaps we should do a little better on that. I'm preaching to the choir for me, one. But, but, but the older brother who's done all the work, who's kept the farm going, who's been there day in and day out, 
says you hadn't even killed a goat for me and my friends. And you just lay a big old spread for this sorry, no good, good for nothing younger brother of mine. My granddad used to have a line is a, uh, well, you know, they're just kind of Freddie Freeloader. And I can see some of that. Some of us stay around, we stick around, we do what we're supposed to do, we, we keep the farm going. And yet the party's for somebody else. <laughs> Don't you love it? The thing I always remember is that the father came out and pleaded with the elder son to come in and join the party. The thing that always quandaries me the most is, did the older brother go in or did he just stay on the porch? You know, that's kind of how it is in God's kingdom. Think about it in this, this kind of this, this idea of what it means for traditional conversion experience when a child or a person young accepts the faith and comes in and stays after it just carrying right on. You know, the ones who use their faith to influence them in their life to do good for other people. And then the younger people that are just all over. You know, usually when somebody talks about a classmate that becomes a preacher, they're like, I didn't see that coming. I would have never thought that would have happened. And yet, as, as, as it goes on, and as I've experienced life a little bit, I realize that the great, there's a great joy and there's a great peace and there's a great presence of following after God for longer in our lives. Sweeter as the years go by is how the old song goes, and that kind of fits the case. The younger son out squalling the property all the way and leaves him with nothing. He missed out on that opportunity to be around his father and in the family farm. And yet when the elder son has been there, been able to be around the father, be able to keep the farm going, has the gratitude and appreciation of the father, and everything that he sees is his on the farm. And he's still bitter and aggravated. But I think the heading in the Bible, that little editor's mark about this story, might be best served by saying, parable of a loving father. Ah, you know, you got two characters, the younger brother and the older brother, but the real gift in the story is that father. Ready for acceptance, to welcome, return to express appreciation for keeping the farm going and the love. And all that is, is the Father's. To offer to, to, to both sons. And the Father, even the, the responsible party, can't talk the Father out of making irrational decisions about what ought to be done. You ought not be having a party for Him. And the Father says, it's mine, I'll do with what I want, and I'm going to. Because the son of mine who was dead has returned. Hmm, what good news in the gospel. Is here in Lent? Doesn't matter if we're the youngest son that's a squanderer or the older responsible party who's always done what always should be done. It's the father that loves both, cares for them, invites them back and encourages them and nurtures and sustains them. If I looked really close somewhere down in my soul and in my being, I probably would see a little part of me that's the younger son. And there's part of me that's the older son. 
you know, I got my ideas and my hurt feelings and, you know, all that stuff, that baggage that we carry around. And yet the gift of the gospel is the fact that God loves us and cares for us, wants us to have all that is, the very best of life, the power of the gospel to take root in our life and in our world, to transform and to change, to change our vision and our lenses of how we see others around us. Oh, it's difficult. It's challenging sometimes. But the Father's always there, on the ready, watching and waiting and hoping. All glory, honor, and power be to the one who was, who is, and who is to come. Amen.